very briefly at Acts chapter 11 at the very end, and then we're going to jump over Acts chapter 12. Remember what Acts 12 is? Peter in prison, released from prison, Herod eaten by worms. Yay. Because he didn't repent. We don't want anyone eaten by worms, but if they don't repent, then they're an enemy of God and they're an enemy of God's people, and Herod was against, was against God and God's people and God's church. So that's chapter 12, but the end of Acts 11 and the beginning of Acts 13, they tell us more about this, about this church. So that's where I want us to go to today. Look with me just very quickly at the end of Acts 11, uh, and we're going to pick up some things that we didn't highlight before. In those days, so it's at the church in Antioch, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, if you're looking at your maps, you know what? It sounds really strange to say came down from Jerusalem to Antioch because if you look at a map, Jerusalem is down here. Here's the sea coast. Jerusalem's down here. Antioch is way up here. But remember, Jerusalem was a very high, uh, a high elevation, and so it came down. It has to do with elevation. So they came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and then one of them named Agabus. Aren't you glad that your parents did not name you Agabus? <laughs> okay. Um, but, <laughs> we're glad about that. So it's more than one prophet. Uh, there are a group of them, but Agabus we learn by name. And if you'll remember his name, later on in Acts, we're going to hear about him again. He is a godly man that gives prophecies that um, do indeed occur. They do indeed take place. Some of us have backgrounds with this type of thing. We hear about prophets in the church today. And unfortunately, some of the things we experience with prophets in the church today, they're not always very positive, are they? They're a little bit, they're a little bit strange, aren't they? They're a little bit weird. Um, and I'm, they may, it may seem and look and feel a little bit manipulative as well in this area. So let's, we're going to see what the, what the Bible says about prophets. So the Bible says that they were prophets and they came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Well, that kind of makes sense because Jerusalem is the mother church. Antioch is the new church, the baby church. And so there is a strength of leadership and teaching and ministry going from Jerusalem to Antioch. And so here come this group of prophets, and Agabus stands up, and he predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. Now, before we think, ooh, that's kind of weird, that's a little bit creepy or whatever, I want you to see something this morning. I want you to see that he predicts that he says what is going to happen, not by magic, not by thinking about it, not by whatever, but by how? By the Spirit by who is the spirit god not less than god god so by god the spirit agabus says this is what's going to happen so that's important for us it's not agabus it's not his own idea it comes from god and he predicts that there's going to be this famine and then luke writing in hindsight says this took place during the time of claudius and it did indeed after 45 a.d about 46 48 a.d or so there was a, a terrible famine uh, in that area so what he predicted took place so this took place during the time of claudius so when we talk about prophets you remember a few weeks ago i talked about the gifts of god in the church strengthening the church. Remember that? I said gifts grow the church. So very quickly, I want to talk about prophets just a little bit, and then we're going to talk about giving, and then we're going to go on with Acts 13. When they're in the Bible, when it talks about a prophet, one of the first things that we see is that for a prophet there is foretelling or prediction. Okay? This is what will be. This is something that's going to happen. Now most of us, when we think about a prophet, that's what we think about, right? We think, well, that, that's what it is. But I want us to understand something this morning. That's not the only thing that the Bible means when it talks about the gift of prophecy or a person who is a prophet, okay? Because the other thing that the Scripture tells us is this. A prophet or prophecy also involves forth-telling or inspired preaching at that moment, on the spot, and if you want to look at your notes, you'll see under the uh, 
where it has my, where, where I've got that red dictionary, prophet, it says. In the New Testament, one who A, foretold, and B, forthtold. He preached under the direct inspiration of the Spirit. They provided special guidance from the Lord as needed, as needed, okay? So we put those two things together, and generally, that's what, it, that's what you will see in the, in the Bible. To me, what we often see in the church world today about prophets, you know, they'll stand in the front and they, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes, but I got to say it because I'm one of your shepherds. So I'm going to say it because I want you to be protected and I want you to, to know, uh, to be knowledgeable of these things. Um, what I've seen very often in the church world today is somebody will say, I'm a prophet and they will stand up in the front and they will say, okay, how many of you want a word from God? Have you ever seen that or heard that before? If you haven't, good. <laughs> okay. How, how many of you want a word from God? And everybody will say, yes, 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 because they know that the word is going to be a good word. Right? You will be rich. <laughs> You're going to have a new job. You're going to have... Now, God does that and God blesses us. Okay? God does provide these things. God does. But what we see very often, if you have experienced something like that before, Personally, from what I can see in the Word of God, that's not how prophets worked in the New Testament, okay? But what we see here is how prophets work. And so here we have these two, and I want you to look at, before you think, uh, oh, Pastor Jennifer, I don't know about this. It's a little bit, you're getting a little bit weird for us right now um, because prophets speak in a special voice, right? And they do something, whatever, and maybe they wear something a little bit different. Nope. Prophets were people just like everybody else. So what I want you to see is Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And look with me at this verse. What does it say? It was He. Who? God. And actually it's Jesus. And some of the translations will say He personally gave. I love that. I love that understanding of Scripture. Jesus Himself looked at us as a church and he looked at his church. And what did he do? It was he who gave some gifts. Because he gave gifts to be apostles. Some to be prophets. Some to be evangelists. And some to be pastors and teachers. Pastor and teacher goes together. Okay? Some to be pastors and teachers. And you've heard me say this before. I'm your gift. <laughs> um, but I... What God has done, and God does this in every church. So he sees the church and he says, in this church there are needs. And here are some of the gifts I give to the church. I give this, 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 and this. Why does God do this? Does God do this to lift up people? No. So get it straight, brothers and sisters. When there are apostles, when there are prophets, when there are evangelists, when there are pastors and teachers who come through, it's never to lift up a person. It's never to say, oh, this person is so great. God gives a gift. Why? Verse 12, to prepare God's people, that's you and that's me this morning, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That should encourage you this morning. Why does God give these gifts? So that you and I can be built up, so that we can be ready for works of service. What types of works of service? All sorts of works of service, as we're going to see this morning, okay? And so God gives gifts so that you and I can be built up so that we can do what he has called us to do. Not so that the pastors can do it all, not so that the teachers can do it all, or the evangelists, or the prophets, or the apostles. No! God gives these gifts to the church and then they are to use their gift in the church so that each one of us individually starts growing, starts being built up, and then we can do what God has called us to do. That's God's plan for the church. And so this is what we see here. Does that make sense to us this morning? I hope it does. I hope it does. And so Agabus, the prophet, stands up and he gives this prediction. It is for the building up of the church. And you say, how is that for the building up of the church? To say that there's going to be, that there's going to be a, a, a famine. Well, let's see what happens next. Okay? And what we read next was this. 
and he says, so each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the believers who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. And so the gift in this case of prophecy in the church prompts the believers who are there in Antioch. Most of them are new believers or young believers, but it prompts them to what? Works of service, works of ministry, and a work of service and one of the works of ministry is giving. That's one of them. There are many, many more, but that's, that's, that's one of them. And so we see it, in, we see it in, uh, in, in action here, if you will. So I want us to look at that, and I want you very quickly, I said we were going to talk about giving. I want to look at this verse very, look at these verses very quickly and give you some guidelines for giving. Uh, and I've included it in your notes this morning. Okay, who gives the direction for giving in this situation? The Holy Spirit does, right? It says, Agabus prompted, predicted by the Spirit. So if you're looking at your notes, uh, and ushers who are here, you can go ahead and get ready those baskets over there because we're going to take up another offering in just a minute. You say, we are? Yep, we are. We're going to put this into practice, okay? And I'll tell you how in just a minute. But look with me. So it's directed by God. You see, there are ma we live in a world where there are many, many needs, aren't there? Well, I, should I give to this? Should I give to this? Should I give to this? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you. We can say here are needs, but God has to speak to your heart. Because there are some things God will say to Jinky, Jinky, give. And he won't say it to Jocelyn. But there may be something else. Jocelyn, do something about this. And Jocelyn will be prompted. So it's God-directed, number one. Secondly, what is it? It's Christians helping Christians. Does that make sense also? It's Christians helping Christians. That's second. Third, what else is it? This is really important. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send. The leaders did not tell them to do it. They decided for themselves. They determined for themselves, I'm going to give. I want to give. I am prompted to give. And it should be that way. Anytime in Lighthouse when we make known to you opportunities for giving and needs for giving, what we want to say to you is this, in the area of, of giving for need. Now, not in the area of tithe, because in the area of tithe, the Bible is very clear about how we tithe in that. And you've heard us talk about that before. But in this area, it must be, it should be free will. You should not feel pressured to give. You should not feel like, oh, they're talking about money again. No. We, we open the, there's a need. We offer it. We open it. And as God, the Holy Spirit, prompts you, then you give. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so don't go out and talk about me after this service. Okay? But, because what we're doing is biblical here. So we see this. And then what else do we see? The next thing is, oops, sorry, I, 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 forgot, my, I forgot my clicks. Thanks, Andres. Next time you just wave at me whenever I got excited about preaching and then I forgot my clicks. So it's God-directed. It's Christians helping Christians. It was free will. It should be free will when it's giving to need. For, fourth, it's in proportion to the individual's resources according to his ability. So when you give, you give according to your ability. Uh, Paul's very clear about that. He, he doesn't expect us to give and then I have nothing I can't eat at lunchtime today because I have, I have given. Now every once in a while, God may prompt you to give sacrificially, right? How many of you, God has prompted you to give and you gave, but it didn't hurt your pocketbook at all? Yes? There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. That's giving. How many of you, at times, God has prompted you to give and it hurt your pocketbook? Raise your hand. <laughs> yes, that too. And that's good as well. And you know what? That's another level of giving. That's another, that's, that's a higher level of giving. But God has to prompt you to do that. And so it was in proportion to individuals' resources. And then finally, what does it, look with me, they did this, sending it to the elders in Jerusalem, leaders in Jerusalem, by means of Barnabas and Saul. And so there's accountability. Why is it important for there to be accountability in giving? It's important for there to be accountability in giving because the money that you and I have in our pockets 
in our pocketbooks and in our bank accounts. It's not our own. Some of you say, well, yeah, it is too. I worked and I worked hard for it. It is God's. If, we're, if we belong to God, then everything we have belongs to God. And so it's God's, and he gives us the strength to work and to gain, uh, to gain these things. And so there should be accountability as well. It's not just, oh, here, here, have $10,000. Hope you use it well. <laughs> no, there is accountability. And we do our best to have accountability at Lighthouse. So uh, ushers, come forward. Or, yes, Miss Ami. get those baskets and you say what are we going to do we're going to give again this morning you said we are yes I, I told you last week we were going to give this offering is for what this offering is for our brothers and our sisters remember i told you remember now ah okay this is for our brothers and our sisters in northern philippines not that basket yeah the 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 no, not that one the offering baskets, the ones that we used last week. Okay, last week you gave. Some of you say, well, I gave last week. That's fine. You don't have to give this week. <laughs> Some of you say, but if I don't give, people are going to look at me. Who cares? Okay, you're not giving for people. You're giving for God. Nope, not those. Baskets. Baskets, la. Baskets. I'm sorry. I spoke, I spoke strongly. Where are the baskets that we used last week? Are they gone? Find them, Stephen. <laughs> I sprang this upon them, okay? Now, some of you, this, is anybody upset at me this morning? Saying, you're going to take up another offering? Don't get upset at me. You talk to God about this. We're looking at Scripture. Because some of you last week said, I, I wasn't ready to give last week. They're not there? I am. I'm so sorry. We were trying to be creative. That's okay, Ami. Just use the, just use the regular baskets. That's okay. That's okay, Ami. Just use the bags. It's okay. My fault. Yep, that's okay, Miss Lorena. And you can just, you can, that's okay. Just pass it to them and let them pass And because I'm going to keep on preaching. Okay? My fault. Okay? If you say, I gave last week, keep passing it. If you say, I'm not prompted to give, no problem. Keep passing it. If you say, God is speaking to my heart and I want to give something because the typhoon destroyed their homes, use this mic. There's something wrong with this mic? Okay. Stephen, would you? Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Got it? Okay. I can roll with that. <laughs> okay. We put into practice what the scripture says. And we did it because a lot of you last week said, well, I wasn't quite ready last week. But we're ready this week, right? And so that's how we do it. And so I wanted to show you some pictures so you would have some idea of what your giving has done already. This is preliminary because their first need before roof, before having a roof over their head, their first need was we got to eat. Okay? So look first here and here. This is with the Atas tribe on top of the mountain, and they took food. Pastor Vivian said, as she went up the mountain and gathered them together with the food, she said, they spontaneously, the tribe, began to clap and cheer and say, praise God, because they did not know what they were going to eat, because they didn't have food. And I tell you that not to twist your heart. You see, I didn't tell you that until after I took up the offering, right? Because I don't want it to be, let me, put, let me pull your heart and then you give, and, and then you give. I tell you that because this is part of the ministry we have as brothers and sisters. The other two pictures on this side and this side, here and here, are at the, ch the church, the Wawang church, which is the mother church. And that's the church that they're finishing building right now. And they're going to dedicate in about three weeks. Uh, you've got your, you've got, you've got your, your uh, bulletins, right? And you say, well, that's not so creative on the front. Well, it should be. You should be really excited about the pictures on the front because these are the churches that are going to be dedicated in October. On the top, it's the new church building in Wawang to which you have given. Amen. 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 They've, met, they've met in a house for eight years in Vivian's house for eight years. 
And the bottom is in Payatas. They're going to dedicate the church in October. And so we look at this and we see the work of God. So the gifts of God are at work in the church. They prepare God's people for works of service. So if you have given in this particular situation, then God, the Spirit, prepared you for works of service. And this is what you see. They're still to come. They still have to rebuild their roofs. They still have to rebuild their homes and their houses. But Vivian said, already in this one, many people in the community, as they see the church and as they began to help with food, there are people that are already starting to come to the church that have never come to the church before. That's how God does it. Amen? Amen. Amen. You should be encouraged this morning. You should be encouraged this morning. By the way, there are many more pictures than that. These are just a few of them. Okay? So, praise the Lord. So, what you have given uh, this morning, we will send this week. And it will continue to meet the needs uh, of your brothers and your sisters in Karanan and Wawang. Amen? Amen. 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 And then, we move on. Okay? Because I got to, I'm looking at the time. We got to keep on going. And I've put something up here. And those of you who are British, you can go ahead and turn the lights back on now. Those of you who are British are laughing at this. And the rest of you are wondering why in the world did uh, Pastor Jennifer include this on here. Uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you one thing because I'm not really looking at my notes so much. The church in Antioch gave, and I, it's in your notes. But I want to ask you something. Why do you think they gave so quickly? Why do you think they gave, while you're thinking about this, okay? Keep this in your thoughts. Why do you think they gave so quickly? Why do you think they gave so readily? Why do you think they gave so generously? Without prompting, without, now you should give. Why? I think it's because churches and people become like their leaders. That's what I think. They, bec they become like their leaders. Who was their primary leader in the church in Antioch? Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul, but really it was Barnabas because he was there first and then he went and got Saul. And what do we know about Barnabas? The very first time we meet Barnabas in the book of Acts chapter 4, what do we find out about him? He took some land he had, he sold it, and he brought it and he gave it to the apostles and he put it at their feet because there were needs in the Jerusalem church. Amen? Amen. We become like those that we follow. Be careful who you follow. If you're looking up to people, if you're giving your ear to people, if you're giving your heart and attention to people, those people will influence you and affect you. You make sure you're following the right people because we become like those we follow. And let me tell you something else. People that follow you and people that look up to you will become like you too. You will influence them. So it's important how you live. It's important how you act. It's important what you do. And, and we see this principle here so clearly. So now we skip over chapter 12 and we go to chapter 13. And we've got a picture of candy right here. I love candy. And I particularly love this candy. Now, some of you, I'm sorry, I'm going to make a cultural statement, but there's some of you who are purely Asian this morning, and you probably have no idea what this candy is, right? Okay, Gwen says, no, 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 I don't know, even though she's lived in the UK. But Alistair's laughing because he knows. Steve is laughing because he knows. How many of you know what this type of candy is called? Raise your hands. Uh, you see, it's all these... Look, look at all the Brits, <laughs> okay, and all of those, okay? Is it your favorite? She ate it last night. She ate it last night. Okay, now the rest of you are saying, what? Okay, so, so who should we ask? Because we want to make sure. Wh what are they called? Well, you can hey, be, 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 be. One word. Okay, all sorts. Glenda, what are they called? Uh, all sorts. Is that... Licorice all sorts. Steve, is it, we got it right? Okay. They're called all sorts. A-L-L-S-O-R-T-S. Uh, and... <laughs> did, did, you, did you know that? Okay. Okay. 
Why? Okay, now even though Alistair is not a Brit, he's from Canada, so he's got some influence. Why is it called that, Alistair? Uh, because there are all, all sorts of kinds of... <laughs> okay, they're all sorts, they're all kinds of licorice, okay? And people either love them or hate them, right? I love them so much. It's just about my favorite candy in the world. <laughs> okay, now, Tom, you didn't raise your hand, but you knew what they were, didn't you? Oh, there you go. He, he's even got a specific brand name for them, okay? You see, there, there you go. I'm not gonna get into details like that, but... <laughs> But Tom being picky is, so <laughs> that's okay. I understand the uh, passion that we have for just the right type of candy and when it's not the right type. But you're not going to forget this example because I, I think, honestly, I think the Holy Spirit prompted this, you say. Yeah, I think so. Because I want to talk about the church in Antioch. Look with me. In the local church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now that's in your notes as well. A prophet does a, has a particular function. A teacher has a different type of function, okay? It's but still a gift from God. But there were prophets and teachers. And now look with me at the prophets and teachers at some of them that were there. There is Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And the reason I've included that is because, and the reason you got a picture of all sorts here, is because all sorts describes the church at Antioch and it describes the leadership of Antioch. There were all sorts in the leadership. You go, oh, ding, 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 got it, okay? Because the church also was multicultural, multi-ethnic, because the city was that way as well. In Jerusalem, the church was Jewish. Why? It was Jerusalem. It was a Jewish area. But we come to Antioch. It's a cosmopolitan, multicultural city. In the Roman Empire, after Rome and Alexandria, Antioch was the third most important city in the Roman Empire, and there were trade routes that went through it. And so it was a city that had, had all of these different cultures. Well, take a, mo take a minute and look around Lighthouse just a minute. You know why I love the Church of Antioch? It reminds me of the Church of Lighthouse, okay? <laughs> we, are, we are all sorts, aren't we? <laughs> we're all sorts, we've all, and we've all got, but you know what binds us together? Sorry to take this analogy far but I'm going to stretch it, it's because we've all got licorice. You know what that means? We've all got Jesus. That's what binds us together, although we are all sorts. And this is important because it talks about, this is how God brought this church together. Here's Barnabas. What is Barnabas? He probably was a little bit older. He was from Cyprus. He was one of the early converts, but he's definitely Jewish and he had a Greek background, okay? Who's the next one? Or the very last one? There's Saul. Saul, his companion, was a Hebrew of Hebrews. If ever there had been a Jew, it was Paul, Saul, okay? Saul, to be, soon to be called by his, by his, his uh, Roman name, Paul. So you have this, and then look at the ones we have in the middle. Simeon called Niger. What does Niger mean? Niger means black. So he might have either had a dark complexion or a lot of people think it may have been one Jewish parent, one African parent. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But a lot of people think it might have been that. Imagine that in the church at Jerusalem. Never. But Antioch is a different church. And then what else do we see? We see then Lucius of Cyrene, definitely North African, okay? Definitely North African. And then who else do we have? Manaean and Manaean would have been Roman uh, Greek background and he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Who was Herod the Tetrarch? The one who killed John the Baptist. And so Manaean was elite, upper class. He had been brought up 
the, it literally means he was a foster brother of Herod, a foster brother. He would have been brought in and raised with Herod. Um, and so that also means he would have been older as well. He, he would have been quite elderly. So we have this mix here. We have this mix of all sorts. But what we see here is that the church reflects the culture and reflects the society. And it's a beautiful picture of how God brings people together in his family. Let me tell you something. We say this all along. It will always be easier for you to be part of a church or a church family where everybody else in the church is exactly like you, your background, your language, your educational level, your financial level, that will always be the easiest church. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are churches that, that are, are like that. But that's not what God has called Lighthouse to be. As I was preparing, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that the founders of this church said about the founding of Lighthouse. When God put it in their hearts, mom and dad and brother Philip, to found Lighthouse, God the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, I want Lighthouse to be an Antioch. I want Lighthouse to be an Antioch. God's plan. God's design. Is it always easy? No, it's not always easy. Is there rubbing at times? Yes, there is. But this is God's plan. And this is not a comparison with other churches. Listen carefully. God has different plans for different churches. But God's plan for Lighthouse is all sorts. <laughs> all sorts. Amen. Amen. And so here we have this church. And they're gathered together, and they're praying together. And I want us to see what happens next. While they were worshiping, another translation says, ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit spoke, set apart from a Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. You say, now, Pastor Jennifer, uh-uh, wait, 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 wait. This does not say prayer meeting. But if you go back and look at the Greek, it talks about a public meeting. They were together. And what is strongly implied is it was a, a, a worship, a prayer meeting, a, a time of waiting on the Lord together. And so while they are waiting on the Lord, God the Holy Spirit speaks. Was it a voice from heaven and the building shook? Probably not, because in other places that happens, right? In the book of Acts. And Luke just says so. What happened here? I think one of the prophets stood up during the prayer meeting and said, the Holy Spirit says that we are to set to, to call Barnabas and Saul and set them apart. He has a special work for them to do. And I, I, stay with me as we come in these last few minutes this morning. So the Holy Spirit speaks. And then what hap, uh, uh So here's this, let me, before I get ahead of myself. So here's this prayer meeting. How many of you, when we announce a prayer meeting, you don't get super excited? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Don't don't get don't don't raise your hands. We announce a prayer meeting. We don't get super excited, do we? A lot of times, it it uh, it's boring. It's this or it's that. May I encourage you this morning? Because this is the point I wanted us to get to. And you don't have to be here this afternoon at two thirty. Although, wow, the Holy Spirit sure did bring these two things together in just the right way at just the right time. But I'm not I'm not poking at you this uh, this morning. But I am giving I am bringing you the word of the Lord, and I want to encourage you. Because what we see here is a time of prayer together. And when we talk about prayer as children of God, there must be two types of prayer, okay? If you are never part of corporate prayer with other people, that may be with your family, it may be with other Christians, if that is not part of your Christian life, something's wrong. Something's wrong. The Bible pattern is there were times of prayer together. 
Why? Because God will use somebody else to minister to you in prayer time. That's how he does it. So if you're never part of corporate prayer with other people or with a partner in some way or with one or two others, something's wrong. By the same token, if all you do is come to church and that's where you get your prayer, or you say, well, pray for me because I'm going through this, but in your own life, there's no prayer or little prayer, something's wrong. Something's wrong. On both sides, there's something wrong. Because the picture we see in Acts of the church and of the Christians is there are times of individual prayer, there are times of corporate prayer, and God does wonderful things in all of those. For example, what happens when people, people pray? This is not all of them, and this is only leading up to Hebrews, uh, to, excuse me, to Acts 13, okay? What happens on the day of Pentecost? They are all filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? They were meeting together and they were praying. What else? There had been persecution. They were threatened. Don't you talk about the name of Jesus. They got together and they prayed. The place was shaken to show the power of God. You say, well, oh, it's going to shake. Not necessarily. But God was doing something special, wasn't he? He was showing, I am God. All of these people that tell you to shut up and don't say my name are powerless against me. And he shook the place and it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what happened? Oh, brothers and sisters, the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not to say, hmm, hmm, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm better. I'm a better Christian than you. Fooey on that. Forget that. That has nothing to do with what the Bible says. They were filled. We are filled with the Holy Spirit for purpose, brothers and sisters. We are filled with the Holy Spirit for edification, for holiness, for ministry. That's what the Bible says. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what happened? In the face of persecution, they spoke the word of God boldly. That happened because they were praying. It happened because they were praying. What else? The Samaritan believers, when Peter and John and the others prayed for them and laid their hands on them, what? They received the Holy Spirit. I hope you see a pattern here if you want to receive the Holy Spirit this morning. What else? What happens when people pray? Saul is praying in another part of the city in Damascus and the Holy Spirit speaks to somebody else who's not even praying. Ananias is doing his thing. And the Holy Spirit says to Ananias, you go, you pray for Saul, pray that he'll receive his sight. Whoa, Lord, it's Saul. And the Holy Spirit says, for he is what? Praying, praying. That was the key. That was the key. I want you to be encouraged about prayer this morning. I want you to be challenged about prayer this morning. What else? Through prayer, Saul, as Ananias prays for him, Saul receives his sight again. What else? Peter prays, and what happens? Not a prayer meeting, not a whole church prayer meeting, one person. Peter prays, and a woman, Tabitha or Dorcas, is raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. What else happens? An angel appears to Cornelius while he is praying and gives directions leading to salvation. Do you need direction? Do you need, God, which way should I go? What should I do? Get, get into prayer. Get into prayer. What else? God gives a vision. To whom? To Peter. While he's praying, he gives him a vision and that leads him to pray for Cornelius. Things happen when people pray. Here we go. God sends an angel. The church is praying. Peter was imprisoned. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. But the church was praying. And it says, God sends an angel to rescue Peter from prison and execution. That's what happens when people pray. That's what happens when people pray. And so here's this prayer meeting. And, we're, I, and it's, time to, it's time to stop. So I'm gonna, we're going to stop with, hang on. Ready? We're going to stop with this this morning. It's in your notes as well. What does it have to do with prayer? He rewards those who sincerely seek him. I earnestly seek you, says the psalmist. Keep on asking and you will receive. Seeking you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will open. If you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open. Hebrews 15 and 16, hard to pray, discouraging to pray. Jesus knows that. He understands our weakness. 
And because he understands, we pray any habits. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, you need some help? Go to prayer. Pray in the Spirit all times, every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. I've really been taking that to heart because I've been... I've had a lot of things to worry about in the last month or so, and so have some of you, but I'm going to pray instead. Whenever I, whenever I start to worry and doubt and fear grip my heart, you know what I do? Lord, and I pray. First Thessalonians, never stop praying. And then the one that I quote all the time, because it's so encouraging, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has what? Great power and produces wonderful results. What a prayer meeting. What a prayer meeting. Amen. What a prayer meeting. I encourage you and I challenge you, brothers and sisters, let corporate prayer be part of your Christian lives. Let private prayer be part of your Christian lives. There must be both. There must be both. And if it is part of your lives, we will see God move and God work. And you may say, I feel like whatever. Guess what? So do I. But it doesn't depend on how I feel. It doesn't depend on how you feel. It depends on what God says. What a prayer meeting. Out of this, the Spirit speaks, and the course of the church is changed. You and I are here this morning loving God and being Christians because of that prayer meeting. You say, I am? Yes, we are because of that prayer meeting that opened the Gentile world and Paul and Barnabas went forth. What a prayer meeting. Lord, this morning, we thank you for your word to us. And Lord, um, where we are not yet measuring up to what your word says, Lord, every one of us, I pray, O oh God, that we would receive the prompting and the urging and the nudging and the encouragement and even the discipline of your spirit and that we would be what and who you've called us to be. Lord, that we would not grow discouraged, that we would not say, ooh, a prayer meeting, boring. But Lord, we would say, okay, God, your word says this, so I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you that you have been making us like an Antioch church, that that was your, that was your plan for us and that we get to be part of that. Father, we pray that as a church and as individuals, you would make us into the people that we should be and the people you have planned for us to be. Mighty in power, mighty in your word, mighty in prayer, that we would do and be all you have planned for us to do and be. May your gifts be operating in this church. May we not be afraid of them, but may we be open to say, okay, God, here I am. Please use me for your purposes, the gifts that you've put in my life. Lord, help me not to be afraid to step out and to begin to use them, even if I'm shy, even if I'm uncertain, even if I'm nervous. Oh, God, may the gifts that you have put in each one of us in this church, may we use them to bless one another, and to do the works of ministry and the works of service that you have planned for us to do in this world, in this church, with our neighbors, with our brothers and sisters. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. amen.